I first came upon J.S. Mills on Liberty as a first year undergraduate. I remember being struck by the simplicity of Mills' writing and the power of his arguments about individual liberty. Over time though, I realized that On Liberty provides only a narrow depiction of who counts as an individual worthy of liberty. Still many continue to regard On Liberty as a classic defense of individual liberty and a treatise on the relationship between power and liberty. Its enduring legacy is its contribution to liberal thought and the liberal vision of a just society that it articulates. Mill presciently states at the beginning of On Liberty that the question of the nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual is likely soon to make itself recognised as the vital question of the future. This is proven to be true and is a key reason why On Liberty is still relevant today. Different perspectives on the proper limits of societal or governmental control over what we think, say and do the line between what is acceptable speech and conduct and what is not, inform enduring debates about the scope of individual liberty. Mill focuses not only on the relationship between individual and government, but also between individual and society. He was concerned both with the legal and material power of the state, but also society's power of compulsion, of the power of public opinion. Mill's question, simply put, is this. To what extent may society tell you what you can and can't say, think, feel, and do? The foundation for Mill's arguments in On Liberty is utilitarianism. Mill states that he regards utility as the ultimate appeal on all ethical questions. Simply put, the best action is one that maximizes utility, which can be defined in a variety of ways, but generally refers to well-being or happiness. Mill's argument was that a free society in which individual liberty was preserved would maximise the utility of that society and its members. Liberty equals happiness. The development of democratic governments in Europe ended the tyranny of the absolutist monarchies that they replaced, only to pose a new threat to individual liberty, the tyranny of the majority. As Mill states on pages 12 to 13, the will of the people, moreover, practically means the will of the most numerous or the most active part of the people, the majority. The people, consequently, may desire to oppress a part of their number, and precautions are as much needed against this as against any other abuse of power. Here, Mill draws our attention to the distinction between liberalism, the ideology, and democracy, the form of government. The two are not synonymous, and as Mill shows, a liberal democracy is a society in which the majority choose their rulers and liberty is advanced for all, not only the majority. Mill argues that the tyranny of the majority, what he also calls social tyranny and the tyranny of prevailing opinion and feeling, can be more terrible than other forms of political oppression. For while such tyranny may not always involve violence, it is more insidious, penetrating more deeply into the lives of individuals. For Mill, every civilised individual ought to have the liberty to say and do whatever they like, so long as they do not harm others. This is called the harm principle. As Mill argued on page 23, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. The harm principle is seductively simple in theory, but in practice and application it is much more complicated, especially since Mill includes both intentional actions and also acts of omission as things that can cause harm. For example, actively trying to drown someone and also failing to rescue someone who you happen to see drowning from afar are both violations of the harm principle. Both would legitimate a violation of individual liberty. The forms of social power that Mill is most concerned with draw our attention to how we are all simultaneously subject to the power of others and also holders and exercisers 
of power over the people around us. That is why, so long as the individual exists within a society with other people, we cannot escape the actual or potential exercise of power. Power must therefore be limited, ordered and controlled in such a way that individual liberty is universally maximized. Power for Mill is not simply material, it is also social and cultural. However, all forms of power are coercive and they are something that is exercised by someone or something over someone or something else. Mill's conception of power therefore seems closest to Dahl's relational definition of power. A can get B to do something or not do something that they otherwise would not or would do. But even though one might read Mill's work as establishing power as the antithesis of liberty, the relationship between the two is more complicated than this. Mill was concerned about the power that is exercised over individuals against their will, but there are many reasons why individuals would willingly submit to the exercise of power over them. Government is a classic example. In a liberal society, individuals grant government the right to exercise coercive power to ensure the security and liberty of all. Power, in this sense, is both a threat to and protector of individual liberty. A liberal society is therefore engaged in a constant balancing act. It must allow for the exercise of enough power to prevent harm and ensure the common good, but not so much that power erodes individual liberty. On liberty is essentially about the limits of power and the appropriate means and circumstances in which the coercive power of the state and society can be applied. Power is therefore limited. Order is liberal. Justice is individual liberty. But Mill's work also engages with other configurations and manifestations of power, order and justice, or rather injustice. For while Mill articulated a clear vision of individual liberty for those within civilised societies, which essentially included white European states, he was clear that this vision did not apply to what he terms barbarians. By this, Mill meant the peoples of the so-called uncivilised world, who were subject to extractive European imperialism, territorial appropriation, and suppression of their liberty and right to govern themselves. As Mill states on page 24, we may leave out of consideration those backward states of society in which the race itself may be considered as in its nonage. Despotism is a legitimate mode of government in dealing with barbarians, provided the end be their improvement and the means justified by actually effecting that end. Mill's vision then of power, order and justice within a liberal society was a thoroughly exclusive one. Liberty belonged to Europe, to white people. Mill simultaneously defends a liberal order within European societies and a hierarchical, oppressive and dispossessive order of empires and colonies throughout the rest of the world. After my initial reading of On Liberty, I came back to it three years later as an honour student and I was struck at how casually I had dismissed Mill's remarks about barbarian societies, how I had focused on the force of his arguments regarding universal individual liberty and had not reflected more carefully on how his vision of an exclusive racist and hierarchical liberalism was so central to so-called late European imperialism in the 19th century. This provided the conceptual and ideological underpinning of historical events like Europe's colonization of Africa and the horrors and injustices that this produced. On liberty is a classic statement of individual liberty, but we cannot ignore that Mill saw these liberties as only applying to a select few. His liberalism may have addressed the tyranny of the majority in certain societies, but also informed other manifestations of tyranny and the application of power around the world.